Now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the President and Chief Operating Officer of Mattel, Richard Dixon, for an interview with Founder and Chairman Emeritus of Financo, Gilbert Harrison. Hi, Gilbert. Hello, Richard. <laughs> Hello, Hi. everybody. Thank you for being here. I hope you all had a good lunch. Um, we're excited to be here today in this room with all of you. And um, Richard Dixon, as many of you know, is the president and the chief operating officer of Mattel, which is a $5 billion company best known for Barbie, Hot Wheels, Fisher Price, American Girl, and many other iconic brands. Mattel is one of the strongest performers of children's and family entertainment franchises in the world. The platform is amazing and diversified with own brands, partnered brands. We realize the pressure, Richard, that you've been under for the past few years with respect to changes in the industry and more recently the bankruptcy of Toys R Us. Uh, while your year-over-year -year growth was negative, the strength of Barbie itself was amazing, with a 15% growth rate in last year's current currency. Uh, Barbie, which is now celebrating its 60th year in business, has been your baby. <laughs> I've seen you run it for many years, and you have been responsible for the growth. And uh, can you discuss this with the audience? Sure. Uh, well, thank you for that, and um, hopefully all of you know who Barbie is, right? I mean, it's a pretty well-known brand. We are in the 60th year of Barbie business, which is pretty spectacular when you think about it. It's an 11 and a half inch plastic doll that truly has changed the way kids play and has lasted for 60 years. Uh, in particular, today, it's even more challenging when most kids play digitally before they're even introduced to fashion dolls. The key to Barbie, really, and I think it's just an inspiration for many brands, is how do you stay relevant for 60 years? And relevance becomes essentially the secret sauce of how Barbie's navigated uh, through many ups and downs, and most recently, a great surge. As you mentioned, double-digit increases last year. A few years ago, some of you may know, uh, the headlines for Barbie were, were pretty horrific. In fact, there were lots of questions as to whether or not she'd make it, if she was relevant, if girls even played with dolls. But that's before you came back to revive the brand. Yeah, you took that a three-year stint. And, uh, uh, yeah, I was, uh, I was luckily uh, invited back to Mattel to come and help uh, change that trajectory. The most important thing that we did in that process was listen to our consumer and ask people, well, what, what do you think of Barbie? And what came back was really shockingly uh, uncomfortable. She wasn't relevant. She didn't look relevant. It wasn't what girls were seeing in the world. Her body uh, image was arguably unattainable, and she wasn't an inspiration as the original founder intended her to be. So we set forth a whole new course of action. We introduced 26 new ethnicities, giving choice to little girls around what Barbie they wanted to choose. We changed her body, which was probably one of the most epic cultural phenomenons uh, that we did that we got recognized all around the world, including the cover of Time Magazine. And then we introduced what we call Shiro's, honoring and celebrating women of achievement who could be inspiration uh, and inspirational for little girls. And most recently, we've announced something called the Dream Gap, which as brands become more purposeful and Barbie herself becomes an inspiration for girls around the world, it's important that we recognize that girls are more challenged in some cases than boys. At age five or six, most girls don't believe that they have the same potential that boys do. It's a serious issue. And we believe the Barbie brand has a position to help bring voices to those girls and all of us to figure out, well, what can we do? So we launched something that we call the Dream Gap. And uh, we have a clip of it here, if you'd like to show it. We're pretty proud of the work, and we hope it'll inspire you as well to believe Barbie's purposeful statement. Let's take a look. Let's talk about the dream gap. What's that? It's the gap that comes between girls and their full potential. 
the city starting at age five, girls stop believing they can be presidents, scientists, astronauts, big thinkers, engineers, CEOs, and the list goes on. Why? Because what else are we going to believe? When we are three times less likely to be given a science-related toy. That's sad. And when our parents are twice as likely to Google, is my son gifted? Then is my daughter gifted? That's not cool. We need to see brilliant women being brilliant and see how they got to where they are to imagine ourselves doing what they do. But we can't do it alone. Moms, dads, brothers, and bosses. We need all of you to help. We need to close the dream gap. It's up to all of us. Totally, totally inspiring. Thank you. Um, before, uh, talk a minute about the 60th uh, year celebration of Barbie and uh, what it's going to be like. Uh. So if, if you don't hear about it, then we haven't done our job. So on March 9th, we'll be officially celebrating Barbie's 60th birthday with um, an incredible campaign that will go global. We're honoring 60 of the most exciting, inspirational, and powerful women in the world with a digital campaign that will sure to be hit your screens as well, lots of collaborations and partnerships and some really epic moments in culture that will unfold before your very eyes. But a real celebration of Barbie and certainly the inspiration that we believe she is for women and girls around the world. I think we're all looking forward uh, to seeing this. Um, <laughs> tell me, Richard, as uh, you and uh, all of your team has been working hard to restore Mattel by reshaping operations, growing power brands, expanding the brand portfolio, can you discuss with us both the short-term and the mid- and long-term objectives that you have? Yeah, sure. So, you know, we, we've divided our ambitions in short to mid and mid to long-term. Uh, in the short to mid, we're establishing ourselves or re-establishing <laughs> ourselves as a high-performing toy company. Invention, innovation, creativity, marketing, and really making sure that the brands that we do have stay relevant in current culture. At the same time, of course, trying to invent the next big thing. At the same time that we're obviously driving demand and, and cultural conversations, we're also driving efficiency, simplifying processes internally to become more nimble and quick as culture and business demands it. We're evaluating our manufacturing footprint. You know, Mattel's a manufacturer of most of the product uh, that we market and sell. We have over 30,000 people uh, that are focused on the manufacturing of our product, so evaluating our supply chain uh, to make sure that it's most efficient. There's a lot of internal mechanisms that we're working on to better the company as well as external. Working with some of the greatest entertainment partners in the world, Nickelodeon, Warner Brothers, Disney, Universal, WWE, these are all great partners for Mattel. Solidifying those partnerships, inventing and innovating with them to create great product and storytelling for the world. And um, everybody knows uh, the problems that you and your competitors have faced the last year with the uh, closing of Toys R Us, which represented something like, what, 8% of your business. Um, yeah. And uh, one of the ways in which uh, I think you're recovering from this, besides selling more product, whether it's to Amazon or Walmart or Target or, or to some of the independent retailers, is by um, using um, uh, building e-commerce and expanding your platform there. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, how you look at this as being an omni-channel uh, company and uh, taking advantage of uh, what the consumers are looking for? Yeah, sure. I think, look, we're, we're really optimistic about retail landscape, um, despite the fact that there's been turmoil, and certainly we've been subject to a lot of it with Toys R Us. The truth is today, you know, commerce is platform agnostic, right? I mean, if you wanted to go buy a Barbie doll right now, you could, by the way, be happy to take that order, but essentially, you know, as long as we create the demand and the interest in our product uh, and our marketing programs, consumers can shop from anywhere. So e-commerce is, of course, a, a growing you know, outlet for us, but it's really a way of life. And so for, as brand owners, we have to be able to create the demand and the interest and the dialogue with consumers so that where they buy is up to them, whether it's bricks and mortar, 
or e-commerce. Now, we're working really hard to develop the right assets and the right creative dialogue to have really robust campaigns uh, online. At the same time, we're working really well with our current retail partners who also have extensions online. So it is really, I think, more opportunistic than anything else, despite the fact that there's lots of disruption. The opportunity really prevails in the context of the consumer. Um, one of the things that maybe people don't realize is that you really are truly a global company um, with uh, a tremendous sales mix, not only with brands, but within regions. Um, will you talk a little bit about uh, what your performance is like? Uh, we have talked about Barbie, but you have Hot Wheels, you have Jurassic. Uh, talk about the best performers in your portfolio. Sure. Well, we, have, uh, we certainly have a global business. We're distributed in, in over 150 countries. We've got 55 offices around the world. Our business is divided almost 50-50 between the U.S. And the, and the rest of the world. So it's a really great global footprint for Mattel Brands and for our partnerships. The portfolio itself is extraordinary. I mean, hopefully those of you who have kids or were a kid know our brands, whether it's Fisher-Price, which is the largest brand at Mattel, infant, toddler, and preschool brands that most of you grew up with, whether you knew it or not. Brands, of course, like Barbie and Hot Wheels, which celebrated its 50th anniversary last year. In fact, we didn't mention it, but in Hot Wheels' 50th last year, we had the biggest Hot Wheels year ever. Another great <laughs> testament to a 50-year-old play pattern that has sustained the test of time. American Girl, uh, is another fantastic franchise of ours, but we have brands like Magic 8-Ball and Kerplunk and Scrabble, and the list goes on and on. It's, it's a great place, obviously, uh, to work and a lot of fun doing it. So we certainly have great brands and we have great partnerships. You mentioned Jurassic. Uh, we had the partnership with Universal and did all the toys for Jurassic World. Uh, it was a blockbuster success. Much of the toy business is related to entertainment uh, properties and movies, so we try and get the best out there and do the best with it. Um, we discussed a minute ago Europe and the fact that your business is essentially strong in Europe. Can yeah. you, uh, can you go, go into how you're growing the business both there and also in Asia and other places in the world? Yeah, I think that's where the e-commerce question uh, comes to life. You know, we, we've converted ourselves in, into a much more digitally oriented uh, organization both in Europe and subsequently in Asia. Uh, our commerce there and e-com is growing disproportionately compared to the rest of the world. We've, over the last year, really transformed our organization from a talent perspective as well to really be able to understand the digital dialogue, act local, and understand the strategic mindset from a global perspective. But when you're running global brands, it's really important to empower your local markets, to be able to re react quickly, uh, working with social influencers, the different types of PR campaigns that you could only get locally. And the speed in which things are moving today, if you don't empower your local markets to do that, you're going to run risk uh, essentially not to grow. So we're enjoying uh, the European business right now, and I think a lot of it is because we've converted the organization to be more locally empowered and digitally savvy. And what about Asia? Asia has been a fantastic market for us. It's almost a nascent market compared to the population and the industry size. We've got a great growing business with Fisher Price, which is to some extent the gateway brand for the Mattel portfolio. The consumer out there as well is really about purpose and learning. Many of our brands fall into that narrative really well. As you can see, even Barbie represents a purposeful play aspect that's playing again really well in Asia. Asia is a big place. You know, we've got China and Korea and Japan and, and all sorts of other markets there that are, uh, that are growing for us. And obviously the long-term trajectory there is, is pretty significant. One of the things that all companies face are problems at times. And, um, <laughs> Lots of them. Uh, and uh, uh, you're looking at all of these challenges in your different uh, pieces of the portfolio. Um, one of the companies, uh, parts of your business that I happen to like the best, and I know my uh, grandchild uh, loves, is uh, American, American Girl. Girl. I knew you were going to say that. Um, uh, your flagship in New York, uh, uh, what you've done is amazing in the way you're converting the American girl into new uh, areas. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about what you're doing to reshape that business? Yeah, thank you. Um, American Girl is a really special brand. Uh, for those of you that know it, we've got stores around the country, but in particular a flagship in New York uh, and Chicago. Uh, these are incredible experiences uh, for, for your daughter uh, to, to go through. American Girl by itself is 
a teaching brand. It's around teaching girls about American history through doll play and narratives and books. As well, it's about building character, uh, the values that we, uh, we promote through our books and storytelling are really something that we're really proud of. The brand itself has been under challenge uh, as of late. We're working on enhancing even better and more relevant experiences in our stores. We're working on enhancing the product itself, uh, putting premium and luxury back into the product in a more pronounced way. It's a very high price point. Thank you, Gilbert, for contributing all that uh, money to us. But I, we do have to provide that kind of value uh, as, we, as we continue to market the brand as a premium brand. We're also moving more progressively in the digital space with American Girl. 50% of the business is actually online. Yeah, that's amazing. And through uh, our catalog. It is. It's an incredibly um, robust e-commerce business. But the consumer experience could be better. Uh, and we're working on the digital narrative right now. And in the third quarter, we're going to launch uh, an enhanced uh, digital experience for American Girl with new storytelling. We announced a movie deal for American Girl uh, recently. Uh, which we're really excited about, putting American Girl on the big screen. So American Girl is a great brand, and there's no more relevant conversation today than what is an American Girl. You know, I mean, when you think about the opportunities as a marketer to talk about what it means to be an American Girl today and the stories that we can tell to help the next generation uh, provide that kind of value and input and to be the creators and the leaders of the next generation is something that we take really seriously. But... I mean, when you look at, uh, at, at uh, you look at Barbie, you look at American Girl. Uh, I'll be honest with you. We feel like it's to some extent the world is catching up to us, uh, and and we're really excited about some of the powerful messages and powerful movements that are happening in the world. We believe that our brands have always been purposeful. American Girl was designed by a founder to essentially help girls learn about their character, add value, and learn about American history. How old is American Girl compared American to Barbie? American Girl is uh, in its 38th year, I think. Uh, and Barbie is, of course, Did 60. the Handlers found that as well? or were they? No, that was uh, founded by Pleasant Roland, uh, who was a teacher. Uh, and it was literally designed by a teacher with a, a, a book. And that's how the brand started. And Barbie, as you know, was uh, founded by Ruth Handler. Uh, and she designed Barbie watching her daughter play with paper dolls. And imagine that, that was there the was first a different brand, wasn't it? Uh, Barbie was the first, yeah, the first big brand in 1959 uh, when Mattel uh, really first got its start. Actually, the the Barbie brand really started to grow uh, when it had its first commercial on the Mickey Mouse Club, and uh, I use that reference yeah. all the time, yeah, because it was a big risk at the time for our founders and our team to spend all this money on on a TV commercial. Like, what was a TV commercial? Uh, but I use it because. Today, we face a lot of risk. You know, we can't always, from a science perspective, prove what the marketing or that big leap is going to be. And we have to be able to ba balance the risk and reward. And just like our founders took that leap into television and it paid off dramatically, I encourage our teams around the world to take those chances, find those new mediums, create those breakthroughs to drive new demand and essentially reinvent the next chapter of growth at Mattel. Well, one of the things, being headquartered in L.A., you're close to all the movie studios. Yeah. Um, uh, tell us about the relationships you have with the different studios and how that helps enhance your products. Yeah, well, we've, we've ventured into great new space. We've established what we call a franchise management organization, hiring expertise and talent from theatrical to live action to television animation. Uh, some great experts that have come from that space to help unlock the value of Mattel's incredible portfolio. So you will see a Barbie movie, a Hot Wheels movie, an American Girl movie. As well, we've just announced a, tw a slate of 21 television shows that we're going to be working on. We've recruited Adam Bonnet uh, from Disney, 21-year-old veteran running that the channel. The television shows will be what? Uh Animated, live action, all based on our own IP and also partnerships with studios and entertainment companies. Can you give us a little preview of uh, what, uh, what we're going to see? Oh, Gilbert, I can't necessarily give you too much of a preview. But you can imagine in the context of our lineup that there's going to be a variety of amazing shows, brands that you're familiar with, and also brands that uh, will be invented uh, for that next generation of play. And you're also working on a movie. 
about Barbie. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, that. Well, the, what I can tell you is the anticipation for the Barbie movie is pretty significant. Uh, those who love us, those who hate us, everybody's interested in the conversation. We announced Margot Robbie uh, as part of the star, uh, as, as the star of the Barbie movie. She's also co-producing the movie with us. We're working with Warner Brothers, uh, their top talent. We, uh, we, we take it really seriously. The movie will be something that obviously will be carefully curated, will be a global phenomenon, and we think will, again, set the course for the next chapter for the Barbie brand in a really significant way. Um, is there going to be a next chapter with Jurassic Park, or um, what's happening there? There sure will be. We continue to work with Universal. Obviously, the Jurassic franchise is huge. Uh, it's, it's one of the best most recognized play patterns in the world. I mean, who doesn't like playing with a dinosaur, right? So between great toys and great content uh, and a great partnership, uh, Jurassic will continue to be a phenomenal franchise for us. And what's next? Well, I think, you know, when we look at what's next, I think it's around really unlocking Mattel's portfolio, whether it be through entertainment, theatrical, live action, animation, digital gaming is a really important part of our strategy going forward. You can see how our brands could naturally translate into digital gaming, apps, consumer products, live events, Broadway shows. You know, RIP is storytelling in the making. And I think the base of the company being a high-performing toy company has great trajectory. But the real unlock for the long term is looking at, at Mattel as a portfolio, an intellectual property company with probably one of the most recognized portfolios in the world that we can not only market and make, but we could also create the next big thing. But the, the digital piece, let's go into this, because as the, as the consumer changes and as the young person that is uh, buying your product changes, um, they are going online. They want the games. They want the toys. They want the digital experience. You started to say that you're going to do this and unlock it with all the brands. Don't you need to do this in order to... Um, go on uh, to take care of the next generation? Oh, it, it's no doubt. It's, a, it's the price of entry. Uh, we've got to be in the digital dialogue, and, and we are pretty pronounced in it with most, if not all, of our brands. It's not a question of if. It's more of a question of how much more, and ultimately, where can we strike that fine target between physical play and digital play? You know, we believe physical play is really important to stimulate imaginations. Emotional, cognitive, social development are all part of physical play. At the same time, we live in a digital world, and the digital landscape, while exciting and, and uh, playful, could also be pretty, pretty challenging for parents. So we, we take our position in that space very seriously. And so we're toggling both, digital and physical, all day long. And the games in your portfolio. Tell us a little bit about the games in your portfolio. Games in our company is a really uh, exciting division. We've got lots of games, as I mentioned, 8-Ball, which is uh, you know, this, this iconic uh, game that uh, is another one that will be developed into intellectual property and storytelling. Uh, we've got some other amazing games, Kerplunk and Scrabble, of course, is, is a well-known game. But games is one where you see, you have to but launch Scrabble about... Is, is, Scrabble, though, is one that you now have digital, and uh, it's been a, a great success, hasn't it? Uh, we market Scrabble uh, in international markets pretty, pretty significantly, and in fact, Scrabble is a great a uh, learning tool for many international markets to learn English and or other languages. So again, when you think about the dialogue that you could have with a game like Scrabble and wordplay and learning different languages through play, um, that's really the part where games becomes a really interesting place to play. Uh, besides what you see, family games are also becoming a really important trend. Uh, moms, kids are becoming more socially interacted together. Family time is a really important insight. And so through games, uh, we create that bond and that special place that parents and families can get together. I, I think this has just been very exciting, listening to the way you've been able to uh, reshape uh, Mattel. And uh, uh, next Friday, this coming Friday, we're looking forward to the, uh, the Barbie yeah. celebration. Yeah. So, well, um, thank you. Um, thank you, Richard. This has been very, very uh, good and uh, an interesting session. Thank you so much. Thank you guys very much.